Welcome to this afternoon session on LEAD and human health. Um, we have um, an exciting agenda for you today. We're going to talk about LEAD, and we want to talk about um, how it addresses human health and how it's addressed it really since its inception. So when we talk about LEAD, we generally talk about that triple bottom line. It's people, planet, and profit, or perhaps a better word is prosperity. That is something that is intertwined in the LEAD rating system. They are interdependent. You can't really separate one from the other. But this afternoon, we're going to try and focus on that people part uh, of that equation. Let's see if I can make this work. Brilliant. So this is what our session structure is today. We're basically dividing it into three parts or three acts. I'm Act 1, and then for Act 2, we have five case studies of individuals presenting on their case studies, um, and Act 3 is a panel discussion. So we're looking forward to these three different parts to this afternoon's session. So of the five case studies, um, the first one is uh, my good friend Deepa, who will be talking about how buildings shape our lives. Um, and the second one is a particular building, the e-facility building in India, that um, Giri will be presenting on. And then the third one is about product transparency, and that is Rami. And we'll close out with Carly, who will talk about life cycle of a human in the built environment, so really bringing everything back together. We've got a full program this afternoon, so if we can ask you to hold your questions um, until the end. Uh, and another piece of housekeeping, we do need to go through our learning objectives. So this is what we have on today's agenda, which you will have signed up for. Uh, the health and wellness impacts from every LEED credit. Uh, the life cycle of a human inside a LEED building, and Carly is clearly on point for that one. Uh, which credits to target to achieve certain health impacts and how to implement LEAD credits for optimal health and wellness. And our case studies will really highlight that. So who am I? Who's this person talking to you? I'm Sarah Alexander. I know many of you in the audience. But for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the Senior Vice President of Certification and Credentialing at GBCI. And some of you who may have heard me speak before uh, may know that I started off my career as a geologist and geophysicist. Uh, that was a long time ago. It was a first incarnation. But what you may not know, that that is how I met my husband. Uh, he was also a geologist, but he then specialized in geochemistry. Uh, and he works on analyzing meteorites and intercellular dust on the origins of our solar system, which is way over my head. He's got a huge brain. So he's now a cosmochemist, which it means that whenever we hear anything on the radio, my ears prick up when I, when I hear about uh, cosmochemistry or anything to do with the cosmos. So I'm telling you this because in July of this year, I was driving home, uh, and I heard an interview on NPR. And the interview was, somebody, was with somebody called Dr. Adam Frank. And he is a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of, of Rochester. And in this interview, he describes our current Anthropocene era. And his question from a cosmic perspective of whether there is life elsewhere in the universe, with the observation, and I am going to quote here, that if you build a world-girdling civilization that's sucking up a huge amount of energy, that they will all push their planets into climate change. And then the question is, does anybody make it? Does anybody make it to sustainability? Can any civilization navigate its transition, its climatic change transition and make it through to the other side where you have a long-term relationship with the planet and you're not wiped out? So fairly fundamental questions that I know that we're, we're all tackling. So that's one of our questions that we're going to be looking at um, today. So keep that one in mind. If we look at what we're doing here at USGBC and GBCI, we're clearly passionate about our lead rating system. It's what is our driving force day in, day out. And we believe that lead can help provide an affirmative answer to that question, do we make it to sustainability? It is a proven market transformation tool. 
which is holistic by design, balancing each of the dominant elements that make up the built environment with a view to planetary impact. Whether you view this through the lens of human health, climate change, environmental health, or resiliency, just to name a few of the different elements that, that are involved, we know that within LEED, you can't view one of these in isolation of the other. It is all intertwined, and it is all balanced in the LEED rating system. So every LEED project protects and improves the health of people around the globe via both micro-level strategies within the building, but also macro-level strategies. And it's at that macro-level that we really want to talk about, or I'm going to talk about in this sort of act one of this afternoon's um, presentation. LEED not only contributes to the health of the occupants of the building, but also to the well-being of society and the community around it. We believe that the back building of a healthy building and community is a sustainable building and community. And if we remember back to when LEED was first launched, so back in 2000, some of the key human health elements that we were sort of battling at that time was eliminating smoking from inside buildings, asbestos, lead. We made a lot of progress on those. On some of them, we've been entirely successful in terms of smoking inside buildings, certainly with here within the US. There's still work to do on lead and there's still work to do on asbestos but those may not be the primary drivers that are influencing our designs today. And more recently, with the realization that we spend so much of our time inside, um, and the acknowledgement that we need to develop credits that help us have more healthful activities, be more active within the building, and not have this sedentary lifestyle. So we saw the development of pilot credits, such as the active design credit. And with LEED v4, the focus really started shifting towards thinking about changing behavioral activities within a building. And this is also obviously highlighted in the well-building standard as well that GBCI provides certification services for. So LEED, it's created this foundation of the built environment to move as a whole towards sustainable alternatives. And with LEED, we've set in place the structure to help us get where we need to go. This is evidenced by more than 95,000 registered, and some of those are certified projects, over 40,000 are certified, that are currently participating in LEED, and the emergence of other standards um, in this area, and not least of which is the greening of our local codes, which I think is um, a cle clear indicator of the the proven market transformation of the lead rating system. And certainly in the US, more than 400 municipalities and 32 states and 14 federal agencies reference lead as a best practice for achieving their sustainability goals. And even without, um, in other countries, in India, has also acknowledged and incentivized the adoption of LEED. So it's not just here within the United States. And projects in India are eligible for tax incentives. So the LEED rating system is our method and our framework for navigating complex and what may sometimes appear to be competing issues that affect us on a global scale, such as energy, air, water quality, resiliency, human health, and of course, environmental stewardship. So let's take, take a step back for a moment and remind ourselves of the LEED development process and the goals that were set for developing of LEED v4. And one of the key questions was, what should a LEED project accomplish? And that's our second key question of the day. And the outcome of those deliberations are highlighted here on this slide. And they became known as the seven system goals. So we've got reverse the contribution to global climate change, enhance individual human health and well-being, protect and restore water resources, 
We can't live and survive without water. Protect, enhance, and restore biodiversity and ecosystem services. Promote sustainable and regenerative material resources cycles. Build a green economy and enhance social equity, environmental justice, and co community quality of life. And these system goals were translated into the lead impact categories and the weighting of the points um, for each of those impact categories. Categories are given more emphasis um, in terms of the scale, scope, and severity of the relative contribution that they, they make to the build environment. So climate change came out on top. But you can see our topic for this afternoon, human health, um, is right there up with it, and it's the second most important impact category in LEED V4. So this slide just uh, emphasizes that. So what is health when we say health? This is the World Health Organization's um, definition, and you'll see this might appear in a couple of presentations um, this afternoon. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. What factors influence health? So for those of you that were at the um, closing summit plenary yesterday, um, you might have seen Chris Pike bounce onto stage and give us the statistic that when it comes to health, only 20% is really related to health care. The 80% is to do with our environmental and socioeconomic factors um, within our lives. Small amount is also due to, to genetics. But the majority of what influences our health comes directly from the built environment, our income levels, and our activity levels, how we behave, how active we are, whether we smoke, and what we eat each day. And the case studies presented today will talk about how the design of our physical environment has a significant impact on many of our health-related behaviors. So we've got a color wheel here. What we're doing um, in this particular part of the session, so we've got here, this is lead V4, we've got all the credits and the credit categories sort of arranged around in this, in this color wheel. And we're gonna start to highlight different credits for different health attributes. So just keep this one in mind. We've got the integrative process in teal. Do I have a pointer? Not quite sure. Yeah, not sure that's working. Um, right at the top, so on the hour, on the 12 o'clock, coming around to location and transportation, sustainable sites, the, the credit categories that you're used to um, every day. So we're actually going to talk about this in terms of influences or dependencies on human health in the built environment. So we're going to start off talking about air, air quality. Then we'll look at water abundance and quality, avoidance of toxicity, healthy ecosystem services, and lastly, physical comfort and fitness. So let's start with the first one, air. In 2016, about 80% of the world's population lived in communities where ambient air quality guidelines did not meet those established by the World Health Organization. And this is a map that was published by The Economist that illustrates that. So pollution sources come from industry, energy generation, dust, agricultural practice such as burning stubble, transportation, waste management practices, and of course from households. And smog or ground level ozone is formed when industrial emissions from power plants, factories, cars, and other sources react with the heat and sunlight in the atmosphere. I think that's probably something that is well known by this audience. Not only is poor air quality a cause of heart and respiratory diseases, including lung cancer, but it is estimated that ground level ozone will also reduce staple crop yields by up to 20%, or 26% by 2030. And that's obviously a key factor with a growing population around the world. And a recent report by the Health Effects Institute also found that 95% of the world's population is breathing dangerously polluted air. 
and the burden is falling hardest on the poorest communities, where the gap between the most polluted and least polluted countries is rising rapidly. Experts estimate that exposure to air pollution contributes to more than six million deaths worldwide last year. And the problem can be most acute in Asia, in China, and India, accounting for almost half of that death toll. So let's look at LEED. So LEED directly and indirectly addresses air quality through numerous credits across the four credit categories, as highlighted on this color wheel. So I've started to pull out the credits that do impact air quality. So whether it's location and transportation, if you have an effective and efficient public transportation network, you're going to use less personal travel, uh, which is going to help reduce some of those, uh, those smog effects. Sustainable sites, energy and atmosphere, that one will be obviously intuitive, and indoor environmental quality. The key thing about LEED is you can think about human health and the indoor environment, but you can't do that to the exclusion of how you get there. If you scrub the air to the extent that is pristine for the interior occupants, but you're using so much energy that might not come from a clean grid that you actually are contributing more to the problem outside of your building. So LEED, by having to balance all these different uh, aspects of when you design and operate your building, is making sure that one is not done to the exclusion of the other. So we've got at least 15 credits and prerequisites in LEED that directly impact interior air quality. And we've got over 43,000 certified commercial projects that have earned the associated prerequisites. That's more than 7.2 billion square feet with an improved indoor air quality as a direct result of LEED. So returning to our first question and Dr. Adam Frank, humans have been harvesting fuel for millennia whether it was dung initially or then wood, we've been doing it. This is not something new. But most recently, fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. And now that we've identified that climate impact from fossil, fossil fuels is a primary cause of climate change, I think we all agree in this room, and that question of does anybody make it to sustainability our continued existence, it really does require that we address it aggressively. So transitioning to renewable resources is only part of the solution, but the biggest impact will come from greater e efficiency in buildings and in vehicles. So in the US, um, in 2016, the EPA uh, estimates that 28% is accounted for by vehicles. So when we have lead credits that address public transportation, you can see how that there is a direct link to air quality. Let's move on to water, something that none of us can exist without. So it's necessary for life. But according to the UN, water scarcity affects more than 40% of the world's population. We may have been fighting over oil and fossil fuels, but water will be the next resource that becomes really restricted and, and really precious. And over 1.7 billion people are currently living in river basins where water shortage or water usage exceeds recharge. And that's happening here in the US as well. So this is not a problem that is exclusive to developing countries. This is happening in, develop, in developed countries as well. So access to clean, potable water is critical. And bringing this issue close to home was the example in Flint, Michigan, Michigan. And that is still an ongoing problem that years later is not completely resolved. And if you think about climate change and more extreme weather events or increases in temperature, that increases our need, both humans, other animals, plant life, for more water in order to sustain themselves and to cool themselves down. So we've got this constant um, drain on our resources and our water resources. 
So the conservation strategies that lead projects put in place, not only for their interior water use, but also for exterior water use in irrigation, and the overall emphasis on reducing portable water usage really is important to ensuring that within the wider community, we are using as little of that precious resource um, as we need to. So measures that are taken in one building, again, can have an impact on a more macro level within the community. So lead credits, again, in multiple categories, do address water, water conservation and water protection. Whether it be reducing impermeable hardscapes so that we can get that recharge into our aquifers, whether it's construction activity, pollution prevention, parking footprints, restoring and protecting natural habitats. Um, all of these directly and indirectly address this precious resource, water. And in addition, with V4, LEAD is addressing cooling tower water use. Um, it's also including um, addressing PBTs, um, source reduction, and rainwater management, all of which directly address human health. And let's, let's just take that last one in terms of rainwater management. So we've seen the disasters that happen when we have hurricanes come through and we have flooding. You get buildings um, that go underwater, there is mold, there are other environmental and human health factors that come as a result of that. But one of the other things that we have to think about is waterborne diseases and being a vector for those diseases. So we may not think of it so quickly here in the US um, and in some Western nations, but this is a really key issue um, throughout the world. And LEAD addresses this. It addresses making sure that you're managing your stormwater appropriately so that you don't um, encourage the spread of those waterborne diseases. So they can be from mosquitoes, it can be ticks, it can be flies, you've got dengue fever, West Nile virus, malaria, all of these are impacted by standing water. In addition, there are microbial waterborne diseases such as uh, Legionnaire's disease that can also be, be um, a cause of, of ill health. And what we can say is that on this slide, over 35,000 commercial projects have actually earned this stormwater management um, credit. So that's uh, a huge indication that this is taken seriously. And in LEAD v4, the rainwater management credit goes a step further, promoting thinking on the macro scale, and projects are designed to replicate the natural hydro hydrology and water balance of a site based on historical conditions and undeveloped ecosystems in the region. Materials and toxicity. Oops. Too fast. No, there we go. Um, so the link between indoor materials and health have been a major focus of LEAD v4. And credits requiring building product disclosure and optimizations, low emitting materials, PBT source reduction, um, all directly address this topic. And on a more macro level, environmental site assessment, site management policy and practices, exterior materials, exterior ETS policies, and controls, pest management, all of these also have an impact on human health. So a building's ongoing purchasing policies, um, their custodial practices, the uh, materials that they're using to clean their buildings, these can all have an ongoing impact on the occupants within a building. So sanitation and waste management is another crucial topic that we probably take for granted here in America. Most Western countries, waste collection and sewage treatment is taken for granted, but this is not true throughout the whole world. Sanitation and waste disposal to landfill can lead to the spread of diseases, toxins leaking into groundwater, and air, air pollution from anaerobic decomposition. Landfill sites also attract animal vectors for some diseases, such as seagulls, rats, and flies, Odor and dust can be associated with landfill. And from its earliest inception, LEED has tackled this issue through credits that reward projects who divert their waste from landfill through reduction, recycling, 
composting and reuse. Collection of waste and recyclables promotes conservation of resources, provides a, uh, a supply of new materials to the industry, and re reduces waste disposal via landfill or incineration. So we've got over 3,500 projects that we've reviewed and have earned the credits associated with reducing mercury, lead, and cadmium, or copper. And in lead V4, the storage and collection of recyclables, the prerequisite, now requires safe collection, storage, and disposable, disposal of mercury-containing waste. So V4 has taken it a step further. Ecosystem services. Here we're talking about health-related ecosystem services and disease ecology, which is the health impact of ecosystem changes. So disease ecology explores comprehensively how changes in a whole suite of factors, all of which are interrelated, such as population dynamics, movement, psychological state, species riches, richness, relative abundance of species, that can alter the, alter the risks of exposure to infectious diseases. And according to the World Bank, floods and other water-related disasters account for 70% of all deaths related to natural disasters. So those coastal or barrier systems that we've been concreting over, such as mangroves, coral reefs, vegetated dunes, and coastal wetlands, they're really critically important to reduce those impacts from flooding, whether it be from a hurricane, from a serious storm, whatever the cause may be. So the preservation and restoration of these ecosystems do have a direct impact on our health. So we've got almost 33,000 projects certified have achieved the lead credits that directly impact land ecosystem preservation and restoration and these projects are all over the world. They're not just here in the US, they're in China, they're in Asia, the Caribbean, Europe, and in Africa. So really across the board, this is recognized as a really key and important uh, area. And in the whole building life cycle assessment credit, project teams reduce and quantify the impacts of their project has on our ecosystem services, such as global, war global warming potential, depletion of strategic ozone, um, and you can see the, the list here to do with acidification um, and, uh, and other aspects that impact the ecosystem. So physical comfort and fitness. Environmental characteristics can impact mental health and well-being both directly and indirectly acting through various pathways and processes, including extrin extrinsic factors, sorry, it's late in the day, uh, so factors from the physical environment, personal factor factors, and socioeconomical and cultural factors, which we talked about earlier. And our modern day environment, certainly here in the States, we have a very high standard of living, and it's enjoyed by many developed nations, but it's promoted sedentary habits. Modern transportation, labor-saving conveniences, and office-centric jobs have created an environment in which millions of people fail to get the minimum amount of recommended daily physical activity. I'm one of them. I try and make up for it at the weekend, but I'm definitely one of them during the week. And as such, the built environment in which we spend the majority of our time can have a profound impact on our mental health, impacting mood, stress levels, sleep, and more. Through its credit structure, including pilot and innovation credits, LEAD directly rewards projects that implement active design strategies and organizational policies that support mental health and well-being. While a walkable site, access to green spaces and nature, and safe bicycle networks are obvious strategies to promote physical activity, other LEAD credits, such as heat island reduction, excessive heat gain, and, and glare, light pollution reduction, access to the night sky, access to quality transit, less time spent community, commuting, also indirectly impact health and well-being. So within a building, 
strategies that address lead credit, such as acoustics, thermal comfort, daylighting, and others, have all been associated with increased mental and physical well-being, as well as an enhanced cognitive functioning and reduced absenteeism. And over 28,000 projects have achieved the thermal comfort credits, and that's over 3.8 billion certified square feet. And if you're not already familiar with the, the biophilic design pilot credit, do take a look at it, because it considers and cultivates humankind's innate biological connection with nature within the building. And it shows how beneficial this can be um, to, induce, to reduce stress um, and a sense of coherence and belonging, improve self-confidence and self-discipline, hormone balance and creativity. So now that we've sort of done a bit of a whistle-stop through, stop view through um, the lead rating system, we put all of those credits back together going as we went through them in terms of air, air quality, um, water quality and abundance, avoidance of, of, of toxicity, health ecosystems and physical comfort and fitness, you can see that almost every single lead credit is highlighted. And we've done this to illustrate to you just how intrinsically human health, that people part of the equation, is baked into every single aspect of LEAD. So it's just something that we wanted to do as a, a takeaway um, from today's session. So returning to one of our original questions, what does a LEAD project accomplish? In the area of human health, which is the second most important impact category, I think we can confidently say from the examination that we've done today that LEAD impacts human health a lot. And to that question from Dr. Adam Frank, do we make it to sustainability? This is obviously a global work in progress. But with over 70,000 certified projects, and I'm including residential projects in that number, and counting, LEED has demonstrated that it can have and is having a profound global market transformation tool that impacts our world-girdling species, Homo sapiens, and ultimately, the outcome of our very favorite and very, very precious pale blue, bot, blue dot. Thank you. That's the end of Act One. It is. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce Deepa, who is the Executive Director of EN3 Sustainability Solutions, who's going to talk to us today um, about human health. Thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to focus on one aspect of buildings and how we have implemented certain measures to improve human health, and that's basically from the context of indoor air quality. Uh, essentially, we know that uh, you know, buildings have an impact not just on our physical well-being, but overall quality of life itself. And what is more important is health itself varies with every individual, depending on the circumstances and depending on the environment. And this is where buildings have a huge role to play, because it's not just about what we do within the building, but it's also about where our building is located and the neighborhood around what we do in that neighborhood and the impact that it has within our building. You know, I come from India and our indoor air quality is probably better than our outdoor air quality in many areas. So you're not talking about just implementing measures. You know, typically the solution to every problem is bring in more fresh air so we can dilute the indoor contaminants and create a healthier space, but air is not necessarily fresh. In fact, an anecdote is if you look at ASHRAE, and we've been working with ASHRAE for many years, is somewhere along 2004, 2005, they t changed the terminology from fresh air to outdoor air because outdoor air is not necessarily fresh in many parts of the world. So essentially, the environment in which the building is located, and that, again, has a huge impact on what happens within the building and the overall impact to the occupants itself. We all know the Sustainable Development Goals by United Nations, but what 
is very interesting is at least five out of the 17 goals are addressed by green and healthy buildings directly and another four more indirectly. So essentially, this is of prime importance. It's not a choice anymore. And green and healthy buildings are important, not just for the planet, but also for all the people that inhabit it. Um, I know Sarah talked a lot about uh, LEED and addressing various aspects of the indoor environment within LEED. Uh, I'm going to talk about two case studies specifically on indoor air quality and what we did and how we use the LEED framework to actually implement better measures. Um, case study one is on an existing building. It's about 11-year-old building, a little more than 160,000 square feet, 2,300 people, and it's a 24 by 7 operation. So you actually have a building that's working right through and it's very densely occupied. So what were the key indoor air quality issues in this building? Very dense occupancy, we're talking about 65 square feet per person. The default occupancy as per ASHRAE is 250 square feet per person. In India, we pack a lot more people within a much smaller space, simply because we want efficient flow plates and you know, our buildings want to be utilized as best as they can. But that creates a lot of issues from an IAQ perspective. Outdoor air quality is not great either. The particulate matter 10, PM10 values outdoor was as high as 190 micrograms per cubic meter. And the CO2 levels outdoors was already close to 700 ppm. So if you're going to bring this air within the space as it is, it's going to create a bigger indoor air quality problem than that exists already. The HVAC systems were standalone systems. They were ductable indoor units with very little ventilation. Uh, they had fresh air openings that was provided by the building with very little air coming into the space. Poor filtration systems, the maximum that they could handle was MERV6, and even that was clogged and not maintained properly. So essentially, it's a disaster, and it's a completely poor indoor air environment. And they came to us, they wanted to actually go for a lead e-bomb or go for a lead existing rating through the lead arc platform. And when we got in, we realized that they have much bigger issues than even before we can address lead in principle. So what did we do? We said when we looked at it, we wanted to actually test it because before we can take a solution to a client, we want to know what the values are so then we can devise what corrective actions can be taken. So these are the parameters. The permissible limits as per lead is in the first column, and then those were the range of measurements on site. The TVOC levels were as high as 6,600 micrograms per cubic meter, with 500 being the maximum threshold. The CO2 levels were almost 3,000 ppm. Uh, the reason the CO2 levels were so high is because of very dense occupancy. The more people you pack in with poor fresh air and filtration, you're going to increase the CO2 levels within the space. TVOC levels being high had three issues. Many of the materials that they had used were actually not low VOC materials. They continuously off-gassed, and you know, that was being picked up by the airstream. The entire HVAC is a recirculating system, so it just picks it up, throws it back again within the space, and it builds over time. And the particulate matter was also very high because the outside particulate matter levels were very high. So essentially, most of the parameters were not met. Even though LEED ARC looks at TVOC and CO2 levels, we thought that we should measure other parameters too so we know how the overall indoor air quality performance is. So what were the materials that were contributing to all of this? Uh, obviously, TVOCs were the carpets, the furniture, and the entire uh, interior blinds, which were made out of fabric. Um, VOCs were also coming from the panes and all of the uh, uh, you know, finishes that they had within the space. We had uh, you know, polyurethane emissions from the HVAC insulation system, formaldehyde from wooden partitions, and you know, obviously the PM10 issues were because of the poor HVAC filtrations. So what did we do? We first set up a dedicated outdoor air system for the building so that we could actually take outdoor air. We put in filtration systems in these DOAS units so that it would filter the air and then it would pump into the conditioned space. 
Uh, we also did a complete flush out of the building for 21 days. It was a nightmare because it's a 11 year old operation building. So we actually had to do them early in the morning, late in the evening, at the weekends, and as a 24 bar seven operation. So it was very difficult, but we had to do that because we really needed to remove all the contaminants that were already existent inside before we could do some more corrective measures to improve it. We increased the filtration to MERV 8, but that was the maximum we could push because these were existing systems. The fan pressure drops were minimal. The fan static couldn't take higher pressure drops. So we really couldn't do a MERV 13 filter. We pushed it up to MERV 8. We replaced some of the existing materials, especially the interior blinds and you know parts of the furniture with low VOC materials. Uh, we installed standalone activated carbon filters in many parts of the uh, uh, condition space to be able to pick up the TVOCs and remove it as much as it can. We again couldn't integrate the activated carbon filters to the centralized HVAC systems because these filters have a very high pressure drop. And when you try to put them in existing systems, basically they don't work. So we had to actually do standalone systems within the space in addition to the existing HVAC system to remove the TVOC levels. And we introduced a lot of indoor plants, specific uh, types of indoor plants that could actually absorb a good amount of CO2 levels. So basically, we went ahead with a bunch of these measures. A lot of this, though we had measured and we knew what the values were, we really didn't know what impact it would have after all of these measures were implemented. So we retested the entire space to see how effective this implementation was. It did bring down the values, not so much to lead thresholds. We were able to only come down to about 1,600 micrograms per cubic meter on the TVOCs. It's still almost a 5,000 uh, uh, you know, value reduction, but we couldn't hit the 500 uh, permissible limits as per lead or well building standards. The CO2 levels basically came down again from 3,000 to about 1,500 ppm. We couldn't go lower. The probable solution was to expand and move a lot of people to another zone so we have less occupancy, so we have better CO2 conditions, but that was not a choice that the building could do. But we did come down to a good extent on the particulate matter levels because of the DOAS systems that we were able to implement. So essentially, we use this lead arc platform because we were taking them through the certification as part of the human experience requirements of lead arc. We went ahead with the IAQ testing and the implementation. Uh, they didn't still score a whole lot of points in the human experience. Uh, uh, category yet, but at least what it did was it took the building through a complete cycle so they could understand how they were performing. And as part of their year two, year three recertification process, we are working with them to actually revamp the entire HVAC systems to be able to accommodate better systems with better filtration to achieve even better values. A second case study, and this is a very interesting one because this is a new interior fit-out project in India. Again, it's for a large multinational banking company. Um, they are aspiring for a LEED ID plus C V4 platinum certification, about 130,000 square feet, 2,000 odd people again, and you know, 16 hours and two shifts of operation. It's basically the back office of the bank that's being set up here. Um, the interesting part of this is they had just finished another building which had got a LEED version 2009 platinum rating and they were going to repeat whatever they did in that building in this new building. And you know, we were trying to work with them to explain that even though LEED addresses human health and IAQ, in version 2001, uh, 2009, it addresses it to a limited level and WIFO addresses it at a much higher level and it's not going to essentially meet what we did in that building may not suffice for this building. But they were very insistent that no, we just got that certification less than a year back. I'm sure it's gonna work. So what we did was we offered to test the other building first because this building is yet to be designed. So we said we will test your existing building which is a LEED version 2009 platinum 
to see how that building is performing as per the IAQ requirements of V4 well and other you know, health-related uh, rating systems, and then we can decide on the next course of action. Um, to their surprise, not so much our surprise, they did not meet the IAQ parameters in spite of being platinum rated. And that's not unusual. We're seeing that with many projects especially because I think that you know, from version 2009 to V4, there's been a big jump in terms of the lead requirements, in terms of the thresholds and projects that complied with the earlier version don't necessarily comply directly unless they do something more. Uh, their TVOC is, of course, better than the other building that I was talking about, but it is still 680 to 700 micrograms per cubic meter in spite of using all low VOC materials and getting all the low VOC credits in version 2009. CO2 levels were still up to 1,200 uh, ppm, and formaldehyde was the biggest thing in terms of their formaldehyde emissions being at 49 parts per billion. I'm sorry, the... The, the circles don't match the uh, numbers. But essentially what has happened is that in spite of that building being less than a year old and being platinum rated, in the new version of LEED was not complying. And if they were to go in for well or other uh, wellness ratings, definitely would not be in compliance. They also had an issue with background noise in the sense that it was higher than the acceptable limits as per LEED. So, after testing, we went back and we said we would do implementation measures to the existing building and also adopt the same measures with the new space. So we introduced activated carbon filters in the supply and air handling systems on all the floors. Again, this did not work because the fan static was a limitation, so we had to introduce booster fans along with the activated carbon filters to make sure that these filters worked. We also added UV lamps to the air handling units to reduce mold and bacterial growth. One of the things that we did, and they had a very extensive building management system that was tracking so many things, but it was not tracking the status of filters within the air handling units. So we actually connected the filters to the IBMS system so we know if the filters are working and it would generate an alarm when the filters got clogged. So at least that would prompt the ONM team to go and clean and maintain it. We also added some indoor plants in workstation areas, and for noise, the entire air handling unit room was acoustically insulated, and we added sound attenuators to all the supply adducts coming out of the air handling unit rooms to make sure that the noise levels are within acceptable limits. And then we went back and measured to see how effective these uh, uh, measurements, uh, how effective these implementations have been, and. Pretty much uh, TVOCs, they're almost there again. In a few areas, they're about 500, but almost at least in the other areas, they were able to meet the lead thresholds. So what does this mean essentially? Lead is a great platform. It provides a great foundation for us to not just look at uh, energy efficiency, which has always been the first approach that we've done, but also look at uh, indoor air quality and the indoor environment per se projects that are certified and went through version 2009 don't necessarily comply with V4 and may have to do many more things to actually comply with V4 requirements. The LEED ARC platform was very interesting because uh, the moment we started getting clients to measure and monitor, that's when it prompts them to actually want to do something about it. And it's an ongoing process. And we've been able to help the project do certain implementations in day one, year one of ARC, but as year two and year three of recertification, make further improvements to enhance their human experience score, their overall ARC rating, and eventually a better environment for all. It addresses, I think, human health, like Sarah said, in many ways, provides a great foundation for other wellness ratings like Well, Fit Well, and the others to further build upon. So essentially, even though we have a lot of these requirements and we implement them in the design and construction of the building, when we go back and see how they operate is when we actually get a wealth of data. A lot of times, 
what is planned and designed well in day one essentially is not operated and maintained well and it's definitely not used sometimes in the way it's supposed to be used. So this is a great learning exercise for us to be able to tell buildings that it's not just enough if you select low VOC materials, no matter if they come with the EPDs and the HPDs, it doesn't necessarily translate to lower TVOC levels in reality on an ongoing basis. And you know, buildings have to keep testing, monitoring, and improving to make sure that they continue to meet these thresholds. So that's just a short summary of uh, the two case studies and just wanted to highlight on IAQ because air quality is such a big uh, issue back home and you know, anything that we do to improve it goes a long way and you know, that's, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Yeah. So I'm here to present a, board, a case study on a building, e-facility building, uh, with respect to lead and human health. So this is a software development center based in India. It's in one of the smaller cities in India. And we got uh, rated as the world's second highest and India's highest ranking lead and version 2009 building. Uh, we pretty much scored 100% uh, on everything except for materials and resources, where uh, being a new building, we couldn't uh, gain any points on the material reuse. Coming to lead for human health. So with respect to vehic vehicular emissions, uh, like India is home to 13 of the top 20 and 33 of the top 100 most uh, polluted cities. And uh, you know, if pollution continues at the same rate, life expectancy is expected to drop by about uh, 10 years in the next five years. So the lead strategies that we employed, we employed a smart uh, transport strategy and parking plan to promote alternative modes of transport for occupant con commute, for reduced em emissions and sound pollution that contributes to improved human health. So we implemented uh, free shuttle service, uh, electric charging points, about 4% of occupancy ratio. Uh, the parking plan we redesigned to make sure that uh, in India we use more of uh, light motorcycles. So we provided uh, more parking space for two wheelers, about 72%, 19% for bicycles, 1% for pool parking, and only 8% for solo cars. And uh, we also added a lot of amenities like uh, the indoor cafeteria, gym, and indoor play area, primarily to reduce staff movement. Uh, we also provided subsidized bachelor accommodation at the walking distance so that a uh, lot more people move in closer. Uh, we provided a one-time green incentive to employees shifting to within three kilometers of our office. So the outcome... Uh, like our carbon emissions uh, today is about 40 times lower than the typical uh, global standards. And after one year of occupancy, uh, we found that almost 18% walked to the office, about 30, 36% used public transport, and 43% used light motor motorcycles, and only 3% traveled by cars. Uh, our project, uh, we implemented the LEED ARC platform right from the day we got certified. And we've been uh, continuously monitoring our uh, ARC score as well. And uh, like uh, we are currently at, uh, with respect to transportation, our score is about 93% against a global average of uh, 77%. Coming to water, we have major crisis of water in India because India is home to almost 16% of the world's population and uh, our freshwater availability is just 4%. And we use uh, groundwater heavily, and 80% of India's drinking water, and uh, nearly two-thirds of irrigation needs are from the groundwater. And this has uh, led to a drop of about almost four meters in many areas, the groundwater levels. And about 163 million people in India lack basic access to safe drinking water, and 210 million lack proper sanitation. About 28.1% of deaths in India took place uh, due to communicable diseases linked to unsafe water and sanitation, uh, primarily like uh, parasitic and infectious uh, diseases, nutrition deficiencies, and respiratory infections. And almost uh, 500 uh, children under the age of five die on diarrhea every single day. 
the lead strategies we adopted, we employed water use reduction, recycling and reuse, water conservation strategies uh, to reduce overall water needs. So typically the water, uh, waterless urinals, aerators for reduced water flow, all uh, sensor fitted taps uh, to avoid wastage, dual flushing toilets, efficient plumbing fixtures, uh, the 100% rainwater is captured, filtered, and uh, purified and uh, reused uh, you know, uh, to take care of the fresh water needs. Uh, uh, sewage water is uh, treated and uh, the recycled water is used for flushing and gardening. Automated drip and sprinkler irrigation systems for, to take care of the gardening needs to avoid wastage. Our complete water management is fully automated to ensure that the energy is saved at the same time the wastage is reduced. So about our, the, the lead arc score, uh, uh, we, have, we are maintaining about 80, 83 percent score and uh, against a global average of about 58. And our freshwater requirement is, has gone down to 8.5 liters per person uh, per, uh, per day uh, compared to an average of about 45 liters, which is a normal uh, usage. And this is a one year average. Coming to air quality, uh, we implemented, uh, we used all the low or uh, zero VOC pines, adhesives, and sealants. Uh, we installed a lot of uh, um, indoor plants uh, to absorb the CO2, absorb VOCs, and uh, filter dust particles. We installed combination air filters like MERV 13 and MERV 7 to enhance uh, air quality. Uh, we, uh, we supply about 45% enhanced, enhanced fresh air. Uh, we have installed entryway mats, protections to reduce pollutants entering the building. And uh, the demand control ventilation is a fully automated aspect, and uh, we monitor the PM 2.5 levels, PM 10 levels, TVOCs, uh, humidity. Uh, we monitor everything, carbon dioxide, everything we monitor using multiple IoT and non-IoT sensors. And the fresh air intake is directly linked to that. And uh, uh, so this ensures that uh, the indoor air quality is maintained always at a very good level. So we also have a prominent live dashboard displaying the air quality, so which ensures the facility managers are always on the watch for this because it's uh, displayed in the public area where everyone can see the values. And uh, the ARC score uh, we achieved, uh, uh, it's about 95 was, uh, is, the, is our score compared to a global average of about 56 uh, against uh, the other lead ARC projects. And uh, the local average is just 42, uh, considering India being a very uh, dusty uh, place. And we are maintaining our PM 2.5 levels at less than uh, 5 micrograms per meter cube. And the outdo outdoor city average is about uh, 30 micrograms per meter cube. And our uh, PM10 levels we are maintaining at less than 10 micrograms per meter cube when the city average is uh, 61 micrograms per meter cube. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Rami Vagal with Mohawk Group, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Mohawk's experience um, while doing our LEED certification and the well-building certification for our showroom in New York. Before I uh, begin talking about specifically about the LEED credits, I'm going to share a little bit about Mohawk's story and our sustainability journey. So our sustainability program is designed around five tenets of sustainability that address environmental as well as social um, uh, impact. And the program is designed around product transparency, uh, taking into consideration that we are a product manufacturer. Design is a very important component of it. We also look into um, circular economy, and that's where the reuse, repurpose, recycling tenet stands. Uh, as as well as we focus on doing better together, which is one of our important uh, tenets um, addressing the social impact. So 
as part of this presentation, we are going to focus today primarily on the product transparency and material health. And so to give a little bit of glimpse about Mohawk's journey and how we started on this, we started on product transparency with the Declare Label platform where the industry was going through a revolution of addressing material health and what goes into the products. And we were being questioned about what we were manufacturing and what impacts does it have on our communities. So we started looking into Declare Labels and using that as a platform to share our information, as well as then uh, we started looking into the life cycle impacts as well and taking our focus uh, into the environmental product declarations. And through these platforms, we were able to communicate that to our customers and stakeholders. So throughout our journey, what we realized that we are creating these different certifications, but we also need to undergo some of these projects ourselves to understand what the project teams are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and to experience that ourselves. So we first began with the lead uh, flooring lead certification under the 2009 platform for our Mohawk Flooring Center, which is our corporate headquarters, and that achieved the lead gold certification. And then after that, we also started looking into um, how how can we do how can we expand how can we expand our boundaries what are the challenges that when lead V4 was introduced like what are we going to face into that and so. That's the platform that actually enabled us to focus more into material health and then more into the environmental product declarations and really made us focus back into our manufacturing side also to figure out what changes can we make to our product chemistry as well as how can we create products in a way that it minimizes the life cycle impact overall. And that's how really like it made us rethink product manufacturing as a whole. So then the latest one is the one that we um, uh, have done living product certification because living product certification allowed us to focus on product manufacturing, uh, taking it to an entirely next level. So through the combination of our product certifications and our building certifications, we're able to achieve new levels of sustainability that addresses our environmental and social impact as well. And we will be looking into like some of the uh, little details about each of those through the presentation. So just, just, to, uh, just to provide a little bit of glimpse, when somebody like Mohawk or any manufacturer has to do something like this, there is different levels of commitments involved. Uh, the people who are involved in this, it's different project teams, it's our compliance team, the sustainability team, design team, our consultants. There's also a very high level of financial commitment involved in this and then the return of investment because that's really important too, the economic side of sustainability. It also takes up a lot of time, uh, especially for this, especially for the teams that doing a project certification is not their main job. It's in addition to doing their day-to-day -day job that they have to do. So our job as a sustainability team is to ensure that the project certificate, the product certifications or the building certifications become more ingrained into our DNA. It becomes more ingrained into our program and to ensure that it doesn't, it feels seamless. It doesn't feel like you have to do something in addition. It should be something that you should be doing regardless. So that's our team's role. And to be able to do that, we need to show the return on investment. So that's just a little bit of uh, providing a little bit of glimpse of what it takes to create something like whether a living product or whether it's a, a living building or whether it's a lead V4 project. When we decided to undergo uh, the LEED V4 and well building certification for our showroom in New York, the goal was to be able to provide um, our, our employees a place uh, where they can bring their customers. It also sets an example because if we're bringing somebody to our showroom, we wanted them to understand that it's not just about the product, but it's also about the space that they are interacting in. And we want to lead by example. So everybody who is involved in it understands that we're not just um, talking the talk, but also walking the walk. And why is this important? So it is... A, 
because there's market transformation, there's demand for transparency. And so embracing transparency is not a choice anymore. We have to, we have to kind of do it. Again, the health and wellness of the customers and the associates, as well as the environmental and social impact, and to also lead by example. Um, we want to do it. We want to show people how it's done. And we also want to help people get there and partner with our collaborators and other industry leaders to be able to achieve the new levels of sustainability as well. For today's presentation, uh, as part of this case study, we would be fo focusing on the material-specific credits, so the building disclosures, and then the low-emitting um, materials in the indoor en environmental quality. So the first one that we are talking about is the environmental product declaration. So a couple of years ago, when we started on the environmental product declarations, even for our Light Lab project, uh, which was in Dalton, uh, Georgia, so we had a lot of challenges even to find like one one or two more environmental product declaration besides our own products. And it was a challenge to get this. But now when we did the New York showroom, we were able to find at least 21 different EPDs and we were actually very happy and very excited and thrilled that we have reached that far. So from 2015 to 2018, 2017, we were able to make that move and we see the industry going towards that. We also tried to determine that if somebody doesn't have an EPD, uh, if they can provide us with life cycle information about their products and use their self-reporting platform as achieving one of the cre uh, achieving the credit pathways, and if that complies with the program. So there is different ways of attempting a credit. Um, if you don't have EPDs, you're as part of the advocacy, we encourage that you ask the project teams and the manufacturers to um, to get their products. Um, for, for EPD certification, um, and if not, then at least like self-report their life cycle impacts. Sourcing of raw materials, so where the product is coming from, where it is manufactured, if it's responsibly sourced, that's another important part. And the fact that you're required to use 25% of the total cost, that itself puts a requirement. So that itself puts um, a very high expectation. And again, um, it's not the easiest thing because a lot of people are still uncomfortable disclosing this information, but it is possible and we were able to do that as well with this, uh, with this particular project. Material ingredient reporting. So besides um, the declare labels, HPD, health product declaration, or cradle to cradle certification is another way to meet this particular credit, or even manufacturers' own chemical ingredient reporting information if they have self-disclosed report. That's also another pathway that you can meet the credit requirements. Then the focus is on low emitting materials. So. It's not just about disclosing, it's also ensuring that your products have low emissions or zero VOCs. And we try to make sure that any product that we use that contributes towards this category is either low emitting or zero emissions. Um, this particular credit reminds me of our living product certification. So while we are disclosing ingredients and making sure that we disclose our environmental impact, how can we go back and look into like, how to even eliminate these chemicals. Because once you disclose this, you want to ensure that you are finding an alternative and to make sure that your product is um, not including those chemicals in your supply chain anymore. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the living product certification and how we optimize our product manufacturing process. So the living product certification is interesting because it not just focuses on environmental health, it also focuses on um, other aspects such as the beauty and the aesthetics. It also focuses on eliminating um, toxic chemicals from, from your supply chain. Um, Last year, we started with the first product, Lichen, which was our inaugural living product certification. And then this year, we wanted to challenge ourselves and then launch uh, five different products in five different categories, including two carpet tiles, a broad loom area rug, and the first um, PVC-free, redless-free, uh, enh enhanced resilient tile. So we wanted to go on the journey where we wanted to see and challenge ourselves whether we can eliminate like harmful chemistries and create a positive handprint um, through our product manufacturing. 
So this is just one example of uh, how we address this. Um, if you're not familiar with the term handprints, essentially you're familiar with footprint, but handprint is creating a positive impact and giving back more to the community and the environment than what is required to manufacture the product. So I'm going to use an energy example. So what we did was whatever the energy was required to manufacture these collections, we offsetted the we offsetted that through uh, on-site renewable energy and then renewable energy credits, but we also install um, a smart flower. We we have to. We're still in the process of installing ten smart flowers. Um, there's a picture of that. Uh, one of them is actually here in Chicago. If you like to visit that, it's at the Renaissance Collaborative. Um, in Chicago, in the Bronzeville community, and we're able to create a positive handprint because we're providing uh, renewable energy to the communities who are not able to get, uh, who are not able to have access to that. So this way, we're not only creating positive impact on the environment, but also in the community itself. And this is our initiative, enabled to provide. Um, renewable energy for all. So that's the social equity component of this. The other interesting partnership that we did with Groundswell was, uh, so Groundswell is our partner in helping us identify STEM education programs and uh, communities of concern that do not have access to some of these resources. And they're helping us identify uh, communities throughout the country that we can partner with to incorporate community solar and uh, the solar flower projects. So what what what... What I'm trying to say through this is that it's not just about the environmental impact, it's also about social equity and social impact, and that's where um, LEAD and WELL are challenging us to go towards. Another project that we did in terms of like water savings was we started with Morehouse College in Atlanta. We retrofitted their shower heads, which had not been replaced for like 12 years or so, with low flow fixtures, and it was resulting into like 3 million gallons of water savings over a year. Then we uh, partnered with Hampton University in Virginia because our plant is located in Virginia for manufacturing, and we wanted to do something that was local to that community. So that also resulted into like 4 million gallons over a period of three years. So it's actually saving more water than it takes to manufacture that product. And this is the way we are trying to create positive handprints in the community. I think I'm running out of time, and that's probably my last slide. So that's all I had to share. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Mario Golubovic. Um, I'm CEO of Venrico, uh, lead consultant. I'm working in lead for the last 15 years. And uh, me and my team, we have witnessed a lot of the cases where lead has contributed and improved um, quality of life. But I would like to share with you to, today some, some cases uh, where lead actually changed a lot at the places that you would expect less and the projects that you would expect less. Um, I'm coming from Serbia. It is one small country in Eastern Europe, one of the Republic of ex-Yugoslavia that has, uh, that has then um, uh, been separated. And this is one small city in the central Serbia that uh, has suffered a lot the peri period of privatization when all the fabrics were closed. And this is one of the cases of um, Lead Gold Factory, the first one in Eastern Europe. And they are producing chemicals. The, you know, small bowls, the toilet refreshment bowls? And from this factory uh, is supplied actually 80% of Europe. For, for the Kankel factory, and this is a campus. This is a huge campus with many factories. So 
here is how it looks like inside. Uh, people that are working inside are 80% age of 30, 35, highly educated um, personnel that couldn't find the work in other places because there is economical crisis and they're all working in this line. Uh, why I, uh, I took this example to, to show you, um, LEED has contributed here a lot, like a quantity of the air that, okay, has to be increased, but also raised the awareness of the management team about quality of the air. They, they were controlling, they had their own testing system, trash holds, but they're mainly related to the products of the, of the uh, parameters inside. And this helped a lot to improve the air quality. We have employed the strategies also to check natural ventilations of this one for every small angle and sack of this facility to help improve the, the uh, air quality. And of course, those who are working in late and injuries, they, they, they can recognize a lot of these measures that I won't go through it, like airflow monitoring and CO2 monitoring in the other, other spaces. Um, of course, here has been um, a great challenge to respect the VOC also for epoxy flooring for man manufacturing facilities for lead certifications are really great challenge, but also the big satisfaction. And uh, one of the, one of the um, very good thing about the lead is, and I do advise all of those who are working a lead version four, is this pilot credit that allows you to do performance-based uh, verification of indoor air quality in the design and the assessment. And this is what we are implying now on other factories in the Hankel campus, because it does give them a thresholds on VOC limits that they might have not considered before, and it is a tool, helpful tool for them to improve the quality. Another case, uh, another, uh, again, uh, one manufacturing, as I said, we were working on many, many commercial things, uh, projects, but these are per I'm particularly fond of because uh, we were working on indoor quality exactly on the places um, that you might, you might wouldn't expect and they have never thought about. So here's about the daylighting. It's a logistical, uh, logistic, uh, Warehouse, it's like 40,000 square meters. It's like 400 square, yeah, calculating for square feet for those. So, and you can see, this is a model, but uh, this is our model that we were using for simulations, how many uh, openings we have on the, on the top of the building. Because we wanted a lot of daylighting. Although, uh, this is not really completely occupied space. And you will find lots of warehouses, some empty, dark separations that they're never daylight. But here we reached a very good level, not enough to obtain the credit, but enough to show a significant, uh, significant um, cost reduction due to efficient lighting and daylight controls. So um, here it, how it looks alike. The picture should have been a little bit, but uh, there is a really a lot of daylighting here. And I wanted, uh, we used a tool, energy modeling tool, to show the reduction. And you can see the blue line, it's a baseline. It's a ASHRA baseline. And the red one is our proposed design, including the sensors that we have set up on 200, according to ISNA, LUX, for the warehouses, and it was 75% reduction in comparison to the baseline. But uh, one of the figures that I was kind of shocked of, uh, and I wanted to share with you this, and I checked two times with the little manager, is that uh, the cost, the cost that they're paying uh, monthly for electricity is $2,000 for this huge, and mainly the, the practi practical consumption is lighting and some fridge cells. But I was checking like two times. Yes, the cost of electricity in Serbia is low, is 10 cents. But even if it would be double, it would be. So uh, what I wanted to say here, we were going for indoor air quality and we saved the money. Um, and this is my favorite one where lead, uh, I, I, really, I really appreciate lead uh, on the construction phase. So these guys, you know, the workers in Serbia, they have, they're happy to have a job. And 
pages are really low. And you know, usually when you work on late, those who work on late, they know that, oh yeah, there is a problem with the contractors, they want to imply lead, and we have to force them. Maybe we're wrong persons to address. If you go to the workers, as we did, and it was a great, great experience, we explained that indoor quality management plan is there because also it's about them. It's about their health and somebody they cares about their quality of life while they're working. And they have started, they have really uh, considered that personal. It's about their health, about the workers. And they were implementing very, very consciously and in very collaborative way the indoor quality measurements about the paintings, about the con uh, adhesives, whatever they were using. Of course, there were also the paperwork to do, but again, it was a very good experience. And one of the things that they really appreciate, I don't know if you had chance to see, many of you probably yes, are the pilot credits of triple bottom uh, line inform analysis informed design. That there are the tools that you can use now to evaluate economically how much there is uh, economical benefit of implementing indoor, indoor air quality management plan. And I was surprised. I didn't know how we can figure out this, this, this number. And there are the studies, many studies, uh, uh, that are related to the absenteeism due to asthma and allergies of the workers, percentages of the workers that are working there. And there are figures that you can estimate percentage of the um, workers that suffer asthma and allergy and the cost and the salaries. In our case, it wasn't really economically, uh, we, could, uh, we couldn't show a very good case for um, um, money savings due to the low salary levels, but still there are, and we are getting conscious about that. So we are submitting the pilot to GBCI now. <laughs> we'll see how it will goes, but it's a great tool. So these are the cases that I wanted to share with you and they're particular and we're really fond of lead in general, uh, but this is my favorite. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. I'm Carly Bullock Jones. I'm with EcoWorks Studio, founder of the company, and uh, I've been teaching for uh, USGBC and GBCI and IWVI and any other acronym for a long time. So I've met a lot of good folks over the years. I uh, hope to see you all in Atlanta next year. Um, before I begin, I'd like to just quickly ask for each of you to think of a place that you would go anywhere in the world to feel most creative. Your, your happy place. And you don't have to share. I have had people blurt out where they would go. Now let me ask, did anybody go to their office? No? That was a trick question, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, I have had people say, you know, I, I've got a new office, it's a wonderful space, but for the most part, nobody really goes to their office. So let me ask you now, uh, how many of you went somewhere that had some visual or physical connection to nature? You could see it, you could, okay, or perhaps you were already outside, okay, great. So one of the reasons I bring this up is you've probably heard the statistic, I'm going to move through this slide, uh, that you spend 90% of your time outdoors. I would actually challenge each of you to begin to log a week, a day, a month, uh, the hours that you, you think you, you're spending, and, and actually look, you might be spending more than 90% of your time. You might be shocked to, to learn that you're spending more like 94 or 96% of your time, particularly when you're in Chicago in the convention center, it's probably a lot more. Um, you, you probably don't know that there was actually a survey done by the EPA that looked at, at how we arrived at how you're spending, in, in fact, 92.4% of your time indoors. Most of this um, is either in your residence, in your home, your, your work, um, also perhaps in a vehicle. Uh, the message here is, of course, that we are an indoor species. And I actually read an article the other day that said that prisoners perhaps spend more time outdoors than people in an office environment because they have mandatory outside 
time that they have to go out, which is quite sad. But um, and and we know that the built environment, as Sarah even mentioned, you know, has a profound impact on your overall health and wellness because we're spending so much time there. And and you might be shocked to learn that again, genetics play a very small percentage of what determines your health. For this reason, again, the physical, social environment and your lifestyle, uh, this is what really shapes your health. Your choices that you make on a daily basis, they can passively influence uh, decisions you make. They can be healthy decisions or unhealthy decisions. For this reason, I believe architects and interior designers perhaps have a better ability to shape your overall health in the medical industry. And Sarah sort of went through, yes, the impact categories on LEAD before, and I actually didn't know that they were or oriented that way until you showed the, the percentage. What I like to say about this slide is that while only one of the impact categories literally says human health within it, um, we'd be remiss to not acknowledge that any improvement in the other impact categories would certainly have an impact on, a positive impact on our planet as well as our health, even though they don't literally say human health, the rest of them. So we do have a lot of, you know, lead credits that uh, directly relate to perhaps indoor air quality, um, directly relate to human health. Those are things that we're generally dealing with that um, you're, you're concerned more about the inhalation of perhaps smoke or green cleaning, uh, chemicals or things like that. On the other hand, we have uh, lead credits that focus more on well-being and let's say quality outdoor space. Uh, quality public transportation, I should say. All of these, all of these things. Um, I'm gonna touch on a few of those, as well as perhaps some not so obvious areas of lead that you, you haven't thought of that might um, directly impact human health. First and foremost, the, the core of lead, of course, is energy. And we know that buildings consume 40% of all the energy worldwide, and therefore, uh, they cause a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. We've not really always looked at the co-benefits of ener energy reduction and um, better air quality, but I recently came across a study that was released in January of this year that looked at the predicted energy consumption, reduced energy consumption of lead buildings in six countries between 2006 and, to and 2016. And what they looked at, of course, is that there was a substantial uh, reduction in cost due to energy reduction, meaning there were lots of state savings. And of course, that those projects, I should say, um, also reduced thousands of pounds of CO2 in the air, particulates in the air, so forth and so on. So again, of course, your air, air quality is better. The co-benefits, again, that we can relate to perhaps with health are looking now with an estimated uh, we're, we're avoiding people being admitted to hospitals, having asthma exas as exasperations, uh, respiratory problems. So we're beginning to be able to quantify, again, a reduction in energy use has a direct impact on our overall health. This is even more concerning in, in countries, I would even say, beyond you know, the U.S., in countries where if you looked at that $7.5 billion that you're saving in energy, that's uh, perhaps even greater in, in developing countries. Increased ventilation has been an interesting one for me over the years in LEED because when you increase your ventilation, then what do you do? You spend more on energy. But there's been some really compelling studies that have been coming out in the last couple of years about the cognitive benefits of increasing, and, and to your point, having fresh air, not just outside air. So I think it's, it's warranting project teams to take another look at balancing energy reduction with increasing fresh air in the building due to these studies that are emerging. For years, we have sort of joked about the bike credit within LEED. It's been around for a long time and some projects use it wisely, others use it perhaps to, to gain a lean point. You all probably had that maybe on a, on a project. Next to buildings consuming 40% uh, of our energy, of course, transportation is the number one reason we have um, emissions. So if we look at the co-benefits of, okay, we reduce more um, uh, or less particulates and, and greenhouse gases in the air because we're not uh, in our vehicles, the number one um, alternative, I would also say active transportation that people are gravitating towards these days is actually bicycle usage. There are less feelings of depression, more connections to your community, 
So it's, t again, taking another look at a credit that perhaps um, over the years you've had a lead joke about, I don't know. Acoustic performance is also, of course, new um, within Well version four. It's been in the lead for schools rating system for quite a while. If you haven't heard, um, acoustics is the number one complaint. I should say noise in an office environment now. It's such um, an issue that it's actually the number one uh, complaint to 911 in New York City. Um, people are complaining about jackhammers and construction and uh, helicopters and um, traffic noise. This is becoming such an issue, um, it's warranted its own section within well, the well standard, your, your other rating system. So I, I would say that we, we definitely want to take a look at acoustics from outside noise as well as inside noise. Uh, these types of stressors have uh, an overall impact on your cardiovascular system. They can increase your chance of stroke and heart attack. So it's definitely one that we're, we're um, taking another look at on our projects. One of my favorite pilot credits within the LEED standard has been the local food production credit for, for many reasons, um, not least of which there are all kinds of studies that show that you know parking lots that are, have been turned into green spaces again uh, have get people out in their community and have, again, a sense of purpose. Uh, your employees who are engaged in their community are more likely to be engaged at, at the office. They're more likely to have positive attitudes. So this has been a fun credit just to engage again on the community and, of course, for areas that you might have a food desert. Uh, if you've ever heard of a food desert, meaning if your only choices are fast food, then that is, again, one way that the built environment shapes your daily habits. So this pilot credit has been fun, not only in terms of sort of green space and connecting community, but providing perhaps fresh fruits and vegetables and teaching kids sometimes at a very early age about these things. One of the most compelling um, design decisions that we're seeing nowadays is literally and figuratively, like I mentioned, bringing biophilia um, into the built environment if we can. The concern or the issue that we're seeing is, of course, the, most of our clients are like, I want to do this, uh, but there's a cost. And so uh, we're going back and saying, okay, there are studies that show the top five things that uh, people want in an office environment include natural daylight, indoor literal plants, quiet spaces, I would say a view to even uh, a body of water, it doesn't have to be the sea, and, and bright colors. And they're going back and we're looking at, again, the economics and trying to say, look, the green wall that you may uh, want to install that costs so much money could have a really profound impact on your overall productivity of your employees. They can be more productive, more creative. And remember, when I asked each of you where you could go anywhere in the world, most of you, it seemed like, raised your hand and said it was somewhere that was connected to nature, visually, figuratively. So we're trying to, if we can't literally bring in a plant, trying to mimic nature in pattern and color and layout because more, more and more people are craving it. And lastly, I'll just say that um, the, the World Green Building Council's come out with a study also this year that basically said lead buildings are, of course, making a difference. And the top three uh, benefits to lead buildings over the last 20 or so years have been, of course, strong financial returns uh, reduction in energy consumption and greenhouse gases pollution, but of course overall productivity and enhancement to, enhancements to health and well-being. So is everybody ready for happy hour? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hi everyone, so we finished with act two of our little play today on lead and human health, as Sarah explained. And so we're jumping to act three, um, just taking advantage that we have these great experts here today, or our lead fellows with experience that you hear from all over the world, you know, from India to Europe, all over the US, and from different types of projects. So covering, you know, I love that I saw marine vessels. Um, you've worked on all the stadiums. Uh, for the NFL and uh, <laughs> all of the big teams, yes. um, which is a very interesting application, you know, all of the different commercial buildings that we were talking about. Um, and so 
I want to just ask them a couple of questions about that. So we got to the third part. I promise we'll keep it short and sweet. Um, and just so you know, so my name is Flavia. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University. And I'm also the host of USGBC's Built for Health. So it's our podcast where we bring together people from medicine and public health to talk to AEC practitioners. And so this is literally what we're interested about. You know, what are the strategies that can help us make people more productive, healthier, happier in their built environment? And so if you haven't checked it out, it's on iTunes and SoundCloud. And with that shameless plug, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from all of the projects that you have been working on, have you seen an evolution in the talking with the project owners about their interest in all of this human health outcomes? And what are they asking for? Yeah, I think that the dialogue is changing. When LEED started out, the focus has always been on energy efficiency, and rightly so. I mean, at that point in time, that was probably the biggest uh, challenge that we had to overcome. But over the years, it's changed dramatically to people starting to look at what the buildings are doing to their employees, to their occupants. So it, it is critical. The only uh, tough challenge always is, unlike energy, which is very tangible, where there is an investment, but we could also explain to the owner that there is a payback. A lot of the human health-related aspects are soft and intangible in a direct way. I mean, you, you can talk about studies that have increased productivity, reduced absenteeism, better employee satisfaction, but they don't directly translate into dollars. And, you know, that's been the biggest challenge in terms of, as a consultant, making a case with clients to say that, it's important. Yes, there is a payback. It's probably not direct, but it's probably much bigger than even what energy was. So that, that's big, the biggest challenge, to get them to say yes, to want to implement it. But once they've seen that benefit, then there's a huge uh, uh, movement forward. You know, it's like it, people are now feeling the space and saying, yeah, it's different. We don't know what it is, but we can feel that it is different. But you need many more of them to say that for the movement, you know, to move towards a healthier building perspective. Yeah, I think it's part of what Sarah was saying about the triple bottom line and how do you clarify and bring out this people aspect because sometimes we're so blinded by the money and just thinking about the monetary aspect of it that we forget about how do we quantify and what are the metrics that we can use for uh, measuring this human health outcomes in particular and so for the different types of projects. So let's think about some specific aspects of the built environment, and I would love to hear what are some of the strategies that you have seen in some of your projects, and what are some of the obstacles that you have found. Um, and so why don't we start, Carly, you were just talking about biophilia, and how mm -hmm. do you bring biophilia, and I think what you know, Sarah was saying, we have a new lead credit that's gonna be talking about biophilia design, so how do we implement this into projects? I think you can start small, like I said, with, um, if you have an existing space and try to bring in, um, we're, we're experimenting with even just uh, sounds of nature. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're working on, okay, everybody works on laptops these days and they're moving around. There are studies that show that obviously looking outside at nature is beneficial, but there's actually studies that show that your cognitive performance increases. If you, you could even look at a, a tree or vegetation on a computer screen, it might not be as great as looking at literal, you know, outside of window, but we're experimenting even with little things like that um, in the space. So for me, it's been interesting to see our clients um, uh, embrace this as a, a culture change within their companies and that their employees are really invested in this. So um, I think, um, yeah. I don't I know, I'm that. trying to think of the challenges too. That <laughs> come with I mean, it. but that's a really good point that it's also about incremental benefits. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be all or nothing, which is sometimes the fear of some yeah. projects that we so, have to change everything in the design versus right. actually implementing, you know, those little things that I think if you've got a clean anything. slate and you're designing from the beginning, that's one thing. But yeah. uh, I think it's more of a challenge if you've got an existing space and you want to start to bring biophi biophilia in and you have a budget and all of that. So experiment, yeah. looking at different ways, like even virtual reality we've been discussing. Right. Can we, yeah. So is this a trend, so for example, in terms of biophilic design more in the US, how are you seeing it internationally? Yeah, there, there, is, there is also trending in international, uh, international environment, but um, 
I think biophilia is, is something that can be easily, uh, it's compre comprehensive, I think, uh, and will be more easier accepted by the clients and, and well, they are not costly relatively biophilia mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. I'm a mechanical engineer by training and I'm obsessed by the, of the air, you know. And usually the cost that, that hurts clients generally are the systems, are monitoring and censoring. And one of the, let's say, um, tools that I would suggest, if I may put it in that word, that they feel it in the first line personally, these changes. For example, one of my strategies on the lead meetings that last long, four hours with the clients about discussing the costs and the system for air <laughs> quality, I always use the one CO2 sensor, and when it, after 45 minutes, and shows 1,800, yeah, and then you show to the client, so you, you see, we cannot cut, we cannot decide, because too much CO2, and you can see how we are going down, so this is what you need in every room, and <laughs> you can imagine, in fact, us like that, and your employees, for example, that they're not at all productive, right. so they do take this, I mean, they perceive this, so, practically show them one instrument, CO2, it becomes, you know, we're speaking, it's very hypothetical and they don't feel what it means, CO2, mm -hmm. what it means in, in terms of measurement. So yeah, one sensor yeah. and. I often say that if you were to, if I were to put a glass of dirty water in front of you, would you, you probably wouldn't pick it up and, and drink it. And I think it's hard for people to visually, you know, think about air quality and VOCs and particulates mm -hmm. because they can't, I can't bottle it. And I think if you could bottle that, the, <laughs> that, they'd be mortified, right? Like, you know, if you right. went into a client and said, this is what your air quality is. Do you yeah, wanna? and T TVC sensors are now not a big deal, not so expensive. For example, in these manufacturing facilities, we were bringing them to show how right. it comes like. And the, when the people see and feel and they touch the things, right. they, the clients too. It goes back to the metrics and also about this transparency of how do we get people to understand why this is important mm -hmm. and especially when right. you're showing them how it's affecting them directly, yeah. then it's easier for them to figure out what is happening with all of their employees and yeah, especially for the latter their offices. And you were but saying about this. There's office. also the flip side of that and you're working with a lot of projects that are going in for wellness and uh, lead and you know they uh, have the, typically the administrative HR and the facility guys don't want the sensors in the occupied space because every time the value changes you know there is somebody complaining that oh my air quality is not good I'm feeling sick I'm feeling terrible so they want us to actually put all this in the air handling unit rooms have the monitors in the facility offices but not within the working space because they feel that, you know, without educating the end user of what each of these means, every time the value changes, and it changes dramatically over the day, and, you know, they don't want huge uh, HR issues. So the flip side of that is you don't want too many sensors, and we were just doing this, uh, you know, we're trying to work with um, Harvard School of Public Health for their COG FS study in India, which is signing up for some of the buildings to be able to... <laughs> get on their monitoring program and that requires one year of monitoring and you know they actually have 10 employees who need to wear the uh, wearables like the Fitbit so they can monitor the individual health movement activity as well as the work environment in terms of sensors for air quality for lighting and noise and the toughest challenge is they're very okay to have this in the workstation, but they not having employees that actually want to wear them for a year and provide data. So right. the flip side is, you know, as much as we love collecting data, a lot of people don't want too much data because they fear that that's going to create a bigger problem. So we, we need to kind of balance both of this. We need to measure, we need data, but also in a way that it, you know, kind of pushes people to do the right thing without creating too much of uh, concern. Also educating the... The so end users is very yeah, critical. so they won't make such a panic exactly. of, uh, of... So you, you probably have to first take them through the process of why it's important. Why, why I think they, there's more buy and, and then introducing mm -hmm. it, you know, doing it suddenly doesn't help. So it's, it's kind of the, the people aspect is not just with the designers, but the actual people need to be involved in the entire activity. And that's, that's the whole thing about the health and wellness component. Yeah, I love the 
you mentioned that because that's a very critical item that sometimes people forget. We're talking so much about, they think about initial design, the first thing that we're doing, they're thinking about how do they solve the building, but then they don't think about the operation and maintenance and the actual occupants and the impact that that's gonna have long term. And just managing the occupant as a stakeholder as well and someone who's gonna be involved and who's gonna make these systems work or not. Right. Very interesting. And talking about complaints, you know, we're talking about how sound is the number one complaint in all of, you know, everybody who's been in an open office now knows that that's the right. number one complaint. <laughs> in different types of environments, in schools, it's so important. It causes right. the stress levels to change. So what are some of the strategies that you have been implementing or you have seen towards addressing sound quality in buildings? In uh, just, buildings? you know, layout, if you can, just uh, ensuring that you have collaborative spaces versus quiet spaces. Um, now we're, we're implementing um, reflective or, or restorative and meditative type spaces mm -hmm. within in the projects. And so proper space planning, just giving some initial thought uh, on a new project. If you don't uh, have a new project, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I remember years ago when, when USGBC, I don't know, Sarah, you might have been there when you had the system on the desk because everybody had low, where it was like red light, green light, you know, it was like, I. I I have to focus, you can't come up like, hey, what are you doing, you know, what are you working on, because it could be disruptive. So uh, it, it can be a challenge, once again, in a, an existing space, but you can get creative with some of those things to say, I'm approachable, or I need to put my head down and, and work. Yeah, sometimes in systems, it doesn't necessarily have to be some big right. project and changing the office, sometimes it's just thinking about all sure. of these other or the, things. I guess everybody's got the yeah, headphones these them. days. And for example, the NIP, what do you do? Because you were talking about how you have a lot of people in a small space. Uh, we have a lot so of people. We also have a lot of noise. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's always which is the lesser of the two evils, the outdoor noise or the indoor <laughs> noise. A lot of it is to do with planning. And I think that you know when it comes to acoustics and sound, uh, we don't actually think about it in day one. And everything's done. It's occupied and operational. And then it, you kind of realize that or oh, this noise, you know, it's like you don't think of systems planning. Most of the time we have, you know, because we don't want to give 10 square feet of space to put a HVAC unit somewhere, you end up bringing it within the conditioned space, suspending it in the ceiling to save 10 square feet of space. And, and then you have this unit that's generating noise within the work area. So a lot of it is an afterthought as far as sound is concerned. And that dialogue needs to change at the design table. You know, there's, there's hardly... Probably in India, I, I don't even know if we have specialized acoustic consultants. We typically, they only brought on for hotel projects because it's a requirement that they want 35 dB on the bed or you know, something mm -hmm. like that. But very rarely otherwise buildings, you know, we don't even have acoustic designers on the project in day one. And you know, that's, that's not the case even with lighting. It's a bigger problem today. We're looking at light also in a more serious manner. It was like, it was just, wattage all the time, what was the watts per square feet, and as long as people were okay, it was fine. It was not about the color, quality of light. So a lot of that needs to be looked at on the drawing board when we're looking at the layouts, when we're planning the systems. And then it gets addressed uh, you know, in a new project, obviously existing project, it's a completely <laughs> different process. Which is a great connection. Of, it goes back to how do you talk to the owners and how do you bring in those topics and how do you actually get them to, from the start, to make this a priority and something that you have to consider. Great. So with that, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Everybody wants to go have dinner now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, that's a reality, but at the same time, we really need to understand how people's 
Agreed. I would, well, I would just say that I think LEED, you know, has evolved from just focusing on uh, like the thermal comfort survey to more of a, a post-occupant overall survey that looks at light, acoustics, uh, you know, all of those things that we've been talking about. We've been encouraging our clients to look at pre-occupancies, the exact same data, because I think we need more of that information, even if it's not the exact same space. Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, even if they're not renovating the exact same space, it could be an entirely different building. Um, I think that's what everybody's wanting is a little bit more data to the, the why behind it and, and right. So I don't know if there's a grand, um, I don't know, study. That I have yesterday, I have several, participated like, in one uh, show and tell uh -huh. and they have a um, good example of one office here, design office in Chicago uh, that has been certified platinum, late platinum interior. And they have made surveys. Oh, the HKS. professional, yes, yes. HKS uh, surveys, and the figures are significant, like 30 percent, 40 percent of satisfaction, and mm -hmm. different thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustic. Everybody was happy about the acoustic, <laughs> uh, and absenteeism. I can't remember, but figures are 30, 40 percent. So, yeah. it's not statistic mistake. Like we are five, 10 percent. You can mm -hmm. have some doubts. And it was done by one professional. These, these people who are making these surveys are mm -hmm. spe uh, specialized in, in providing these kind of services. So yeah, 30, 40% of general. Now insurances, I don't know. Health yeah. insurances in particular, but yeah. I think acoustic yeah. counts for more. But certainly yeah. that's another key. Yeah, the sa the uh, satisfaction component has gone up. Even productivity, you know, we've mapped for some of our factory projects where mm -hmm. they just do a single activity, so it's very easy to map a textile factory where they are, you know, stitching, say, 1,000 garments a day. And that's gone up to, you know, 1,100 garments a day. So you know that productivity has gone up because of better indoor environment. But uh, not so much insure, at least globally, it's uh, the insurance industry just operates on a different orbit altogether, right. so yeah. that, that continues to remain. So I think tracking data is something that's really now just starting to see if we can see those correlations. Health, obviously, and the health insurance industry in the United States is huge, right. um, and it's very expensive for everyone, everyone concerned. But I think when it comes to accidents, when it comes to other aspects, starting to track those in terms of the safeness of the environment as well as um, what's going on within it. I think those are all types of things that we're starting to measure. Resiliency, all of these we're trying to quantify. So I hope in the next you know, two to five years, we'll really have some data and that starts to really look at it. And you can't go back and do it once they've moved. So that's why we're right. like early on, we're yeah. like, do it now. No. And actually that helps inform the design often, yeah. right? Because they don't realize maybe yeah. they had such an issue with acoustics or. Absolutely. So there, are there any more questions, or shall we call it a night? And um, thank you for those who stayed throughout the entire, entire session. Yeah. And the rest of you enjoy your evening. <laughs>